Hi, Des. Um, we already have two consultants present, and it's 7.30, so we can start. Good morning, everyone. Uh, since uh, we have Dr. Mabunga and Dr. Ansheta already online, uh, let's start our uh, case presentation. Good morning, everyone. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. So um, I am the Cyrilis Linda. I will present the case entitled Cycle. So the objectives of my presentation is are to present the case of persistent depressive disorder in a 12-year-old girl, to discuss the management of depression with comorbid PTSD in adolescents, and to illustrate how to prepare an adolescent victim of sexual abuse for trial. So for the identifying data, this is a case of Ali, 12-year-old uh, female, Dr. grade Des. 5 student. Uh, before we start with the case proper, can we just have a, a documentation so we can ask the clerks and interns afterwards mm -hmm. to turn off their cameras for bandwidth, uh, to preserve the bandwidth? Then also after the... Ano, after the case presentation, we can also um, have another documentation, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, Gams? Uh, asking the clerks and interns to please turn on their cameras. As well as the Ananari and residents and adjuncts. And residents and consultants. <laughs> and consultants, yes. Uh, first page, there are three pages top. Second page, and third page. Okay. Uh, okay, for the clerks and interns and the rest of the audience, we can turn off our cameras for now. Uh, so that we will we will not have any connection problems. Go ahead, Dr. Des. Yes, but no. So um, again, um, good morning everyone. So the objectives of my case presentations are presentation are to present the case of persistent depressive disorder in a 12-year-old girl. Uh, adolescent to discuss the management of depression with comorbid PTSD in adolescents, 
to illustrate how to prepare an adolescent victim of sexual abuse for trial. So for the identifying data, this is a case of Ali, 12-year-old female, grade five student, Christian and Missionary Alliance Churches of the Philippines or Kamakop, um, or popularly known as Alliance from Davao City. She is a victim of an alleged sexual abuse, hence referred by the Women and Children Protection Unit of Southern Philippines Medical Center last July 27, 2021 for evaluation. She was then referred by her forensic evaluator for treatment. The interview transpired in a room initially with the patient alone, then later with her companion. So the informants and reliability, so the informants are Ali, aunt, and grandmother, with a combined reliability of 85%. So for the chief complaint, um, it's lack of energy. And then for the patient, she, did, she had no verbal output, but observed to nod her head to some questions. And then the aunt said, Gihilabtan siya sa iyahang stepfather, or she was raped by her stepfather. So for the pre-morbid personality, Ali was a well-mannered child who was polite to individuals older than her. Being the eldest among four siblings, she was a responsible big sister who assisted her mother in taking care of her younger siblings, even at a young age. She was affectionate to her parents and grandparents and would randomly give them a hug whenever she had a chance to do so. She was also obedient and was seldom heard complaining every time she was asked to do household chores. Also, also she does not talk back to her elders when reprimanded. Moreover, Ali was a playful child and had many friends, both in school and in their neighborhood. When she was not studying or doing household chores, Ali would be with her friends playing. However, when she has problems, Ali prefers to keep it to herself because she was shy to talk about it. So for the history of present illness, three years prior to consult, when Ali was nine years old, her stepfather sexually abused her. When the abuse first happened, the stepfather was drunk. He waited until the younger children were asleep and around midnight, he forced himself to Ali. He covered her mouth so that she can't shout, warned her not to make a sound, and threatened to kill her if she resisted. Ali cried and asked her stepfather to stop, but he continued to be. After the abuse, Ali felt dizzy and had stomach ache. She cried silently because her stepfather threatened her again if she made a sound. And he also warned her against reporting the incident or else he will kill her siblings. In the morning, Ali, Ali's stepfather acted like nothing happened and continued about their daily activities. Ali was hurt and cannot believe what her stepfather did to her. She also felt scared of him, but but cannot avoid him because they lived in the same house and slept in the same room. To make matters worse, she cannot talk about the incident to anyone. In the days that followed, she would hide in the room when her stepfather was, was not around or isolate herself to cry. At night, she had difficulty sleeping because the incident kept replaying in her thoughts and because she's scared that her stepfather will abuse her again. Also, she would dream of the incident that would awaken her. When this happened, she would have difficulty going back to sleep. One week after the abuse, Ali developed fever and had loss of appetite. During this time, she was already sexually abused by her, by her stepfather three times. Ali found the courage to report the incident to her step-grandmother, but she did not believe her. Instead, she was reprimanded and was told that she was making up stories. Ali felt sadder, became weak, and had persistent loss of appetite, and her fever kept on recurring. After one week of having recurrent fever, she was brought to SPMC for admission. There, she was diagnosed with dengue fever. While in the hospital, Ali's biological grandmother visited her. Her grandmother noticed that when she arrived, Ali hugged her tightly and would not let go. Also, her grandmother noticed that Ali feared her stepfather. She would not eat if it was him who would try to feed her, and she would pull away whenever he tried to touch her. Because of these observations, her grandmother took charge in taking care of Ali. After a month, she was, discharged, she was discharged from the hospital, and her grandmother brought her home with her. Since then, 
Ali and her younger brother, whom she shared the same biological father, lived with her biological grandmother. Several days after discharge, Ali fully recovered from dengue fever and she went back to school. However, she still had persistence of lack of energy and had little interest in doing the activities she used to do. She no longer played with her friends. In school, she was noted to withdraw from her classmates and friends, kept her head low, and no longer participate in class and was very eyed. When asked what her problem was, Ali would just say nothing was wrong or that she missed her mother. It was also observed that Ali started developing alopecia and had significant weight loss. Her teacher informed her aunt about her observation, so the aunt asked Ali what her problem was. Ali denied having problems, so her aunt let the issue go. Two months since living with her grand grandmother, her stepfather started visiting Ali and her brother in their grandmother's house. He would bring food for the family and give money for the children and spend time to, to eat and converse with the family. Um, he, he would be affectionate to the children, hugging and giving them kisses on the forehead or cheek. Ali's grandparents appreciated the stepfather's gestures and treated him as their own son. Ali, on the other hand, felt scared every time her stepfather was in their house and she grabbed every chance she got to hide in her room or go, up, or go out of the, out, the house if he, was, if he was around. Every time she saw him, memories of the abuse would return and Ali would feel fear and anger toward her stepfather. When it became obvious that Ali was avoiding her stepfather, her grandmother reprimanded her for being disrespectful. She felt sad and even more withdrew from her family. From her family, in addition, her grades declined, but Ali managed to achieve um, just enough grades to make her pass. The stepfather's visit continued multiple times in a span of three months until he started spending nights with them instead of going home to his own house because he missed the children. Ali and her brother shared the same room, but when their stepfather was with them, he'd ask his stepson to sleep with him in the living room. It did not take long before he resumed sexually abusing Ali. When the younger brother was asleep already, usually around 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., he'd enter Ali's room and abuse her. When he's done, he'd go back to the living room to sleep before anyone saw him, leaving Ali crying and in pain. He threatened to kill Ali and her family every now and then to ensure that she will not report the incident. Also, he warned Ali that if she reports him, he will stop giving them financial support, which scared Ali because both her grand grandparents are poor and the money her mother sent for them was channeled through their stepfather. Two years prior to consult, Ali has suffered repeated sexual abuse from her stepfather. She cannot tell anyone, so she carried the burden all by herself. The events kept recurring in her thoughts, which would scare her and made her cry spontaneously. She had difficulty sleeping, and every 11 p.m. onwards, she would feel dread because it was during these times when her younger, younger brother was already asleep that her stepfather would sexually abuse her. She'd made protective measures like locking her door, but her stepfather would still have his way with her every time he spent the night with them. Ali felt hopeless of her situation, and numerous times she wanted to kill herself by hanging, by hanging. But the one time she tried doing it, her aunt suddenly arrived in their house, so her attempt was thwarted. Her aunt, her aunt had no idea what she was planning because she was able to hide the rope before she saw her. Since her failed attempt of suicide, Ali still had persist, uh, persistent thoughts of killing herself, but thoughts of her younger brother would stop her from putting the act to completion. She doesn't want to leave him because she's worried that no one will take care of him. Ali further detached herself from friends and family. She'd spent her day alone playing with her cell phone. When approached by friends or other members of the family, 
Ali would become irritable and preferred to be left alone. Whenever her grandmother asked her to do chores, Ali would just look at her and act as if she didn't hear anything. This would anger her grandmother and she'd reprimand or spank her. Instead of apologizing to her grandmother, Ali would talk back or walk out from her grandmother. The elders of the family noticed the change in Ali and asked her about what was bothering her, but Ali would just dismiss them. There was also persistence of lack of energy and Ali's family observed that she doesn't seem to care about what's going on around her because numerous times they saw her sitting alone, staring into nothing, while around her, other children were playing. One year prior to consult, no one ever suspected that Ali's stepfather has have been abusing her. Around this time, Ali was abused at least once every two months. Ali continued to lose interest in playing with friends and studying. Her grades decreased further until she failed some of her subjects. However, her teachers would give her a chance to pass at the end of the school year because they took pity on her and believed she was having a hard time because her mother was not around and that her grandparents are too old to help her. At home, she got reprimanded many times for being disrespectful because she would talk back at her elders and was hard-headed. Also, for them, she was lazy from doing any household chores because she would not follow what her grandparents asked her to do, or if she would, it would take too long for her to finish the task because of her, of her slow movements, or she'd commit many mistakes. Sometimes her grandmother would be so mad at her that she'll be hit by a slipper or a stick. She thought that she was worthless and felt sorry for herself. All the more she withdrew from her family. Ali has resigned herself that there is no way out of her situa situation but, but death or running away. But she cannot push herself to go through her plan because she can't leave her younger brother behind. Over time, Ali became apathetic and stopped caring about the abuse and what will happen to her. She stopped struggling against her stepfather whenever he abused her. Events of the abuse still intruded her thoughts but not as frequent as before but the feeling of dread remained. Four months prior to consult, Ali's stepfather failed to transfer back to the living room after sexually abusing her. Instead, he slept beside her until morning. It was dawn and her grandmother noticed that her grandson was sleeping alone in the living room while the light in Ali's room were turned off. It was unusual because Ali normally sleeps with the lights on. She checked on Ali and saw her stepfather sleeping beside her, hugging her wearing only his underwear. She waked and confronted him about what she witnessed, but he explained that it was very warm in the living room, so he transferred in Ali's bedroom because she had an electric fan. He further explained that his stepson urinated on his clothes the night prior, so he removed his clothes. Ali's grandmother became suspicious but Ali corroborated her stepfather's account because he secretly looked at her sternly and she was reminded of the threat against her family. Since that day, Ali's grandmother was suspicious of Ali's stepfather and forbade her from spending time alone with him. In addition, her stepfather lessened his visits to the children and when he did, he did not spend the night with them. Ali felt relieved that she seldom saw her stepfather. However, there was still a lingering fear in her that he might come back. Two months prior to consult, Ali's aunt got married. On the day of her wedding, all the adults in the family were busy cooking the food for the guests, preparing the house, which was also the venue, and doing activities related to the wedding celebration. At around nine in the morning, Ali's stepfather suddenly showed up and picked her up while she was sitting alone outside the house. He brought her to an area with many trees to hide and sexually abused her again. She asked her stepfather to stop, but he just said, Bahala kadira'a. When he was done, he, he allowed Ali to leave to return to the house. Ali felt dizzy after and suffered a stomach ache. She did not tell anyone of what happened and what she was feeling. Around 2 p.m. after the wedding, her stepfather picked her up again and brought her to an area with many trees and sexually abused her again. However, this time around, a cousin followed them to the wooded area and saw what transpired. 
the cousin secretly reported what he, she saw to their grandmother, who was too dumbfounded of what she learned that she became ill and fainted. The family panicked and brought her to the hospital, but they left Ali with her grandfather behind. Unfortunately, Ali's grandfather was not informed of what her cousin witnessed. In the evening, the stepfather arrived in their house and was able to sexually abuse Ali for the third time that day. Ali's mother was discharged from the hospital and was able to go accompanied by an aunt. When Ali's cousin saw she reported what she witnessed her. The aunt called Ali and asked her of the veracity of what the cousin missed. This time around, Ali finally, finally reported what her stepfather had been doing to her because she knew they would believe her because there were already a witness. After hearing Ali's side, the family sought justice and reported the incident to the police, and they filed a formal complaint against Ali's stepfather. Ali was brought to the Women and Children Protection Unit of Southern Philippines Medical Center, and they were referred to this institution for an, for an evaluation. So for the past medical and psychiatric history, um, uh, for the psychiatric history, uh, this is the first cons psychiatric consult of Ali. She has no history of self-harm. So for the medical and surgical history, she has no known comorbids, um, no known allergy to food and drugs. She has one previous hospitalization in 2018 for dengue fever. And for the gynecologic administration history, at the time of consult, she haven't had her menarche. However, around the second week of August, uh, she had her, men her first menstruation lasting for three days with light flow. So these are, um, this is her developmental milestones. So at zero to two months, um, the fine motor holds object placed in hand. And then for the cognition and communication, her inside are towards sound and gurgling, uh, made, made gurgling sounds. For the social, emotional, and self-help, begins to smile, tries to look Third at us. Um, yes, in the interest of time, is yes, uh, what's pertinent with regards to her developmental milestones? Um, uh, it's uh, at par with age. Okay. okay. So to continue, on. so for the family history, um, for the psychiatric history, uh, no other members of Alice's family had depression, anxiety, or other psychiatric illness. For the medical history, there is hypertension in her mother's side. No other heredofamilial diseases were observed. So for the family dynamics, so these, these are the, the members of the family, um, direct members of the family of Alice, so the grandfather, grandmother, her mother, her father, the stepfather, Ali, and her three younger siblings. So for the family dynamics, Ali's mother was 17 years old when she married her father, who at that time was 18 years old. Both stopped going to school when they were at high school level because of poverty and decided instead to work. Ali's mother worked as a sales lady in a store in Davao City while her father was an heiress boy. When they met, they easily got into a relationship and not long after, Ali's mother got pregnant with her. After learning of the pregnancy, they both decided to go home to Ali's hometown to get married and settle. They lived together with Ali's mother's family Family. However, when they were back in the province, Ali's father became idle, preferring to languish in their house while his wife worked in the farm. To make matters worse, Ali's father was a happy-go-lucky type of person who spent more time with his friends and neighbors than helping his wife. This became a source of frequent arguments between the couple all throughout their marriage. Ali's grandparents at that time advised their daughter to separate from her husband but she wanted to give him another chance because she doesn't want that Ali will grow up without a father. However, his negligent behavior persisted despite the growing family. So the couple separated shortly after their second child was born. Ali's father went home to his hometown in General Santos City and she never saw him again. After her father's departure, Ali's grand grandparents helped in raising Ali and her brother. After one year, Alice's mother had a new boyfriend who impregnated her. She later married the man through their tribal leader, and this man became Alice's stepfather. 
Her mother brought Ali and her brother to live with their new husband in his hometown. Though they were living together with the rest of her stepfather's family, they all had a harmonious relationship. Ali's stepfather is a construction worker and at the same time a church volunteer who taught gospels, who, gospel songs and shared Bible stories to children in their local church, while her mother worked in the farm and sidelined as a house help. Three years after their marriage, Alice's mother gave birth to her third sibling. So with their growing family, her mother decided to work as a domestic helper to make ends meet. So Alice's biological grandparents wanted to transfer Ali and her younger brother in their care uh, because they were worried that the two children might not be well taken care for by their stepfather's family because the children are not related to them biologically. However, Alice's mother did not want her four children to be separated, and she trusted her husband and his family because she knew them as generally good people. She also believed in her husband's love for her and her children from her first marriage. Alice's grandfather is both a farmer and a pastor in their local church, while her grandmother is a farmer and sells plants, fruits, and vegetables for a living. Ali has a close relationship to both her grandparents, but she does not talk much about her thoughts and feelings to them. Her grandparents also do not probe much on Ali, thinking that's, that it's her nature to keep things from them, and they allowed it to be so. Ali is known in their family as a sensitive child, and family members just accepted it as it is. After knowing about the events that happened to Ali, her grandparents and other members of the family were dumbfounded. They could not believe that it happened to Ali and they felt regret, anger, and some members blamed each other for it. An aunt blamed the grandparents for not looking after Ali well, while the grandmother blamed Ali's mother because she did not obey her when she asked her to transfer Ali and her younger brother to her, to her care prior to leaving for Qatar. But despite these feelings, the family united to seek justice for Ali. Her mother is coming home to support Ali and plans to get the two remaining children from the care of Ali's stepfather for fear that he might sexually abuse the younger daughter. Moreover, since Ali's family filed a complaint against her stepfather, her stepfather denied everything and his family rallied in support for him. For him. Um, his family filed a counter complaint to Ali's family for defamation of character and another complaint targeting Ali's mother for abandonment so that she cannot get the two younger children. The stepfather had been posting FB Live sessions, explaining his side, and repeatedly telling his viewers of his innocence. Also, he had, be, uh, he had been observed to frequent Ali's neighborhood, looking at their house and observing Ali's family. Because of this, Ali and her family are worried that the stepfather might kidnap Ali and kill her, or he might do something like burning their house just to take revenge on their family. Because of this, there are times that Ali's family would sleep in another relative's house for precautionary measure. Also, their neighbors rallied in support of Ali and her family, and they would guard their place in case the stepfather showed up again. When they see him, they would alert Ali's uncles who are also tanods in their barangay. When the stepfather observed that he had been spotted, he would leave the place. So Ali's family have been guarding her ever since. She is not allowed out of the house without an adult family member looking after her, and her grandmother now sleeps beside her. A warrant of arrest um, is yet to be served against the stepfather. So for the first, uh, yes, what though? Before we go to the personal and social history, I have some clarifications in your history. Yes, what though? Okay. Um, first of all, I appreciate that you were able to clarify from the start that she was referred by the forensic eval evaluator. So is it correct, Dr. Des, that your role for this case is purely therapeutic? Therapeutic, yes. Paul. Okay, that's good. Okay. Um, still, even though your role is therapeutic, it's still important to know the details of the abuse. No. So can you um, clarify for us if the abuse involved touching, petting, was there uh, penetration? And if if it did involve penetration, did it involve ejaculation as well? Um, so for the, the details of the abuse, though, um, it, even on the initial abuse, it involved penetration, though. 
So first she was um there was uh, at first there was fondling and then and then there was also penetration. Um a lot of um a lot of those um assault involves penetration and um oral sex for no. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the point of ejaculation. Um I failed po to ask about that detail po doc about uh, ejaculation po doc. Um, what um, uh, what I was able to ask is um, what happened after and then she would said um, she feels stomach ache po doc. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, why am I asking these questions? Even though you are a, a the ther- your role is therapeutic and not as evaluator. Um, because um, these details might be asked during the trial po doc. And um, uh, um, it is uh, parang it is good to prepare the child, uh, the adolescent, um, of those um, uh, also questions because um, um, it would be repeated a lot of times during uh, the trial, you know? and it might be very um, uh, painful for her to recall all those details. Okay, okay, that's one reason I agree. No, that um. Uh, you have to prepare the child as the therapist um, with regards to this questioning and also that the the type of questioning that will be asked of her if ever no um, it, it might involve stress interviewing no the the um, the defendant's party or the defendant's lawyer might be asking very difficult questions as well um, but aside from that why am I asking about penetration ejaculation um uh, to ano po doc um the possibility po doc that um she might uh get impregnated by her okay. stepfather okay good no um, that's another concern and it might also further uh um stress her out or distress the patient no so yes. um and also I hope I, anyway we will see later in your management ha, how you were able to also um take that into consideration yes, um, the risk of pregnancy okay another question you mentioned kasi that the stepfather still has access to Ali no although not like yes she is being protected by her grandfather and her grandmother but uh legal wise. There are no restraining orders. There are no warrants still, right? At at that time, po, doc, na, no, not yet, po, doc. Um, at the time that you evalu- first, first you, uh, even doc. when even when um August, sometime in August, po, doc, when we, when I was able to do telephone call, doc, I asked about it, doc. At that time, um, still ano pa rin po pina pina follow up pa rin po nila, kasi nash na ano sila, doc, na para under regular daw na processing kasi hindi nila na report pa agad yung mm. incident so they have to follow go through the the, the usual process po do. okay uh, even temporary restraining order is not possible yun na tinanong ko din po doon do parang um hindi wali well, hindi sila naka-secure ng ganun po do okay okay Tapos parang they were they were confident also of the fact na yun nga dok yung yung tanod yung mga uncles tas parang okay. nag 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 merong nagbabantay sa kanila parang ganun po dok ah okay okay um the reason why i'm asking this is it's important also to differentiate if uh, her fear is part of the symptoms of trauma or is it the fear because there is an ongoing threat up to now no mm-hmm. knowing that the that the stepfather is still around or can have access to her um, although it's good that they, they do have some uh, form of protection, but not really, you know, officially um, na meron silang protection. And how is Ali reacting to all this? Ano po, Dok? Uh, when I asked her about uh, that fact, Dok, that the stepfather is still around, um, she feels worried, Dok. Um, according to her, is parang na, na balaka daw siya kay naapag naara daw naara daw gyapon but um she feels naman din po assured because um the the may nagte take care of her especially um uh, her grandmother is always around now with her so parang she feels comforted with that po do. oh okay okay 
Sige. I'll ask the other questions later. Thank you. Thank you for um, anyone else? In any of the other good morning. Okay. Yes. Um, ma yeah, that's really a very re relevant question. Although the sexually abuse happened when the patient was not yet in Minarch, right? Yes. But so no. the possibility of pregnancy. But however, if there is really a penetration or uh, it's more it's more stressful, right? Rather than just by touching or harassment. So that's a valid question so to know more into detail so that you will also know the deeper and the more, the more trauma that the child will be having. Aside from that, uh, you will be showing to us also the ob report of the child later. You have? Um, I, I have the report, for the, but I, I failed to... to Place it in the slide, doc. Sorry for okay, that. Okay, you can just mention also and tell us about the the Obigani report, maybe. Thank yeah. you. Yes, for that. So to continue, so for the personal history, so um, Ali is the eldest eldest child of a G four P four four zero zero four woman. She was home delivered, assisted by a traditional birth assistant. Her mother did not suffer from any perinatal complications. In addition, her development was at par with age. So Babel said six months and was able to say her first word mama at 11 months. She was toilet trained at two and a half years old, but she still needed assistance, including herself, until she was seven years old. However, while, with, while pregnant with Ali, her mother was doing heavy labor in their farm because her father just languished in their home or was with friends having a good time and drinking alcoholic beverages. Her mother was also her primary caregiver and took her to the farm with her because her father was neglectful and her mother does not trust him with the baby. Her father's shortcomings were frequent cause of argument between the couple. So Alice's grandparents have urged her mother to leave her father, but her father, her mother decided to endure because she doesn't want Ali to become fatherless. So for the preschool age, three to six years old, at three years old, Ali became a big sister to her brother. She was welcoming of her mother's pregnancy and was excited to have a future playmate. However, her father did not change. He was still idle and left his wife to work their farm by herself despite being pregnant. They would argue about it frequently. After some time, Ali's mother was finally fed up and followed her family's advice to split from her husband. Hence, shortly after Ali's brother was born, her parents separated. Since her father's departure, Ali never saw him again. In the early days that her father left, Ali kept on looking for him. For him. Her mother would tell her that her father left to find a job so that he can buy toys. At the mention of toys, Ali would feel excited and stop asking for her father. After some time, Ali got used to her father's absence and eventually stopped looking for him. Ali's mother continued to work in their farm, and she would bring Ali and her brother with her at work so that other adults can look after them and other, other young children can play with Ali. Also, Ali's grandparents helped in raising her and her sibling. At four years old, Ali's mother had a new boyfriend who impregnated her, and soon they got married through their tribal leader. Her stepfather was welcoming of both Ali and her brother and treated them like his own children. He was affectionate to them, and he did not use corporal punishment when Ali and her brother misbehaved. Ali again was welcoming of her mother's pregnancy, and when she gave birth to a baby girl, Ali was very happy. At five years old, Ali started kindergarten. She easily made friends with classmates on her first day of school. At a young age, Ali was observed to be intelligent and eager to learn. She was participative in class and had no problem in understanding what her teacher thought. Growing up, Ali was a playful child who enjoyed the company of children her age. She did not throw temper tantrums and was helpful in assisting her mother in looking after her younger siblings. She would help in simple tasks like handing to her, uh, to her mother the diaper and looking after her brother while their mother attended to her baby sister. For the middle childhood, um, 6 to 12 years old, so at 7 years old, Alice started elementary education. 
Initially, she was shy and silent, but after a week, she adjusted well in class and made friends with her classmates. In addition, Ali had three siblings. Uh, like, um, like the previous pregnancies of her mother, Ali was welcoming of the new member of the family. Uh, she went, when she was not playing with the other children in their neighborhood, Ali helped her mother in looking after her younger siblings. She was a polite child and obedient to her elders. With their growing family, Ali's mother decided to seek winter pastures in Qatar. At eight years old, Ali's mother left them in the care of her stepfather and worked as a domestic helper. Ali felt sad of her mother's departure that she would cry secretly at night because she missed her. Eventually, after several days, Ali was able to adjust without her mother because her grandmother and aunt, meaning the stepfather's mother and sister, were there to take care of them. They were treated well, and she did not feel like she and her younger brother were not part of the family, despite not, not related to them biologically. Her stepfather was affectionate to them and tried his best to provide for the children. It, uh, it also helped that her mother would call them or video chat with them whenever she can. In school, Ali was still eager to learn and was participative. She was able to maintain her good grades. After a year that Ali's mother left for Qatar, Ali noticed changes in her stepfather. He started drinking alcoholic beverages and there were times that he'd done home drunk. There were also times that he'd become irritable to the children and when they misbehaved, he employed corporal punishment. He would hit them with a belt or he would pinch or spank them. He would, um, even though she felt sad that her stepfather changed, she thought that they were punished because they did something wrong. Because of this, Ali was more careful with her behavior so that she will not anger her stepfather. Also, she doesn't want to displease her stepfather and the other elders in the family. Time of the third age of 12. Didn't tell anyone because she threatened to kill her and her family. After the Ali felt depressed and scared and alone. In an energy and motivation and study because she felt tired all the time. Her thoughts would frequently drift back to what happened to her and she would feel sad and scared at the same time. Even when Ali was transferred to the care of her biological grandparents, her stepfather was able to continue to abuse her during those times that he'd visit them. Ali felt hopeless while her lack of motivation and energy persisted. And her father and at the same time, and have frequent cares. Other times, they notice her thoughts. The doctors, she would not respond like she did not hear anything. Periods they caught her crying as going through. Ali said that nothing was wrong, and her grandparents just let her be. Chemically, Alice initially she managed to adjust just enough to her projects. However, later, she already failed some of her subjects. Her grandparents kept on reminding her to study well to regain her high grades so that she will have a better future. But Ali is not making any effort to regain her high grades. Since the events of what happened to her has been known to her family, Ali felt a sense of relief because she can finally talk about what happened and help is given to her. However, she also felt shame because her neighbors also found out about it. She's embarrassed to face other people for fear of being judged. Also. Since her, he got a name here. Sister is even village session. Peers and his family. The formation of character. Being an old son, his family have have been insane. Ali Ali feels scared because of the danger her stepfather imposed on her and her family. But she has been constantly assured by her grandparents and other elders in the family that Ali's grandmother now sleeps beside her, which gives Ali a sense of ease, allowing her to have good sleep. Currently, Alice is coming home because she missed her. However, she has decided that whatever happens, she will not separate from her grandparents, especially her grandmother. She'd rather live with her grandmother than her mother 
should her mother decides to live separate from her grandparents. For the substance and unsubstance history, so Ali does not bring up cannabis substance. Ali does not talk. And for the non-substance history, Ali frequently borrows her uh, grandmother's cell phone and play with it to pass the time. She also uses it in watching videos in YouTube, mostly about Korean idol groups and for Facebook. Uh, this helps her forget about her problems and keep her mind from thinking about her stepfather because thoughts of him made, him, made her feel scared, angry, and sad all at the same time. Her Facebook account was on private and she only have relatives in her friends list. Her posts are mostly selfies and photos, photos of her and her family. So for the hopes and dreams, Ali hopes of getting justice from what her stepfather did to her. Uh, she feels ashamed of what happened, especially that her neighbors already know about it. However, her family have been supportive of her, uh, reminding her frequently, frequently that she has nothing to be ashamed of. The incident was not her fault and that they will make sure that justice will be served. Ali feels assured of her family's support. However, she, she still cannot stop herself from feeling shame. She, ho she hopes that getting justice will help her move on. Moreover, Ali dreamed of becoming a teacher when she grows up. She wants to teach young children because she finds them cute. Uh, before I proceed to the physical examination, are there other clarifications, Doc, or questions? One more, one more, although I forgot to ask to you. Uh, during the time of the sexual abuse, uh, yes, the stepfather is always drunk before doing the, the sexual abuse or even not drunk. There are times, well, Doc, there are times that he's drunk. There are times that he's not drunk, but no. Mm -hmm. Why I'm asking this question? It's because uh, if if it's a bit, if it's not drunk, it was intentionally. No, it was an intention. Yes. Probably, kung alcoholic siya, it would be influenced by the alcohol. But more or less, even even not drunk, the sexual abuse was also on the brain. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pado. Um, so. Um Another clarification, this, uh, you, because we already talked about right uh, uh, Ali's fear regarding um, um, her her stepfather is uh, still has physical access to her, um, but she does have some informal modes uh, forms of protection, right? How about yes, naman her reaction to the posts uh, of the stepfather? and the family of the stepfather claiming defamation? Uh, look, look, um, yeah, when I asked her about it, look, parang irritable po, look, parang na-angry siya, look, na parang... But uh, she's aware. The, she's the aware The family po, made look. her aware. How did she she's become aware, aware po, of the posts? Um, they talk about it, po, look, in the family, po, look. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, po, look, so she's aware, look, that's parang... I um uh I when I asked her about it, parang like she said na 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 hamugiro pa man ganit ka ayo ma'am. Parang that's what oh, that's what she so said. She's po, angry so, towards the stepfather for posting all of those things. Yes, po, look. That's okay. um yes, po. And then the kasi in the side of the stepfather, po, look, parang he is confident, po, look, that he can get away with it. Mm -hmm. Parang ganun, po, look. And actually, the family is uh, parang um, in a way, parang na ano din sila, parang, I don't know what's the right word to describe, but parang, they cannot believe that he's as confident as that, na, that, that he can get away with it. Parang ganun po, look. Does it this partly discourage them that the father, that the stepfather is that confident that he could get away with it? Uh, yes, po, look. I asked them about, uh, I actually asked them if they got intimidated by the father's, uh, the stepfather's actions. Uh, uh, tumawa lang yung grandmother po, Dok, na sabi niya na parang um, hindi din daw niya naiintindihan po, parang wala daw siya kasabot, Dok, kung nga nung inad to ang stepfather when, when para sa ilaha, kusog ang ilahang parang kaso po, Dok. Okay, so they still feel mm -hmm. confident naman and they don't yes, feel discouraged. Dok by the grand, uh, stepfather's um, posts. Yes, Yes, Okay, thank you. 
So for um for the physical examination, so um, um basically um Ali has unremarkable um PE findings. So um her BMI is uh, for her age is normal, and the rest of the PE are normal. So this is the WHO growth chart for uh, for the BMI for girls. So uh, if, we, if you can see, um, it's within the the green the, the mark. It's it's within normal. Naka, you, na, she was just that? like nakapatong lang talaga. Yes, ah, okay. uh, um, Were you able to do the the um, genital urinary PE? Uh, no, doc. I wasn't able to to do that, okay. doc. But Not they. Doc. Uh, Obi was able to do that, right? Yes, well, doc. They have a report from us. Ah, yes, well, doc. Um, let okay. me just uh, stop share, doc. Ah, uh, uh, okay. ano ko muna, doc. For a while, po, doc. Excuse lang po. Obi was also able to do a uh, tanner staging. This. Um, I, I will check for Doc. Ha. Okay. Just. So this is the report. So, oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Dapat walang name. <laughs> sorry. So this is uh, the report, po, Doc. It was dated July 2. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, two days after the, the last assault done. Mm -hmm. po, kasi yun po time na discharge yung grandmother. So in here, acute evidential examination within 72 hours of the incident. Okay. So here, Podok. So um, uh, the tanner one, Podok, the anogenital examination. So the external genital tanner okay. one. But as a breast, she's a stage two nano. Um, the no, so general physical. The general physical po, doc, uh, parang stage 2 na po siya, doc. Ah, yes, uh, sa breast, uh -oh. a pubic uh -oh. hair stand staging. Okay. No mm -hmm. evident injury, no evident. Okay. So for the perihymenal area, there is abrasion, right? Okay. Perihymenal tissue. For the hymen, um, partial healing laceration at 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock position. Peridium and posterior foreshad, abrasion, posterior foreshad. Okay. Um, Discharge none, internal and spectrum exam not done. Uh, for the anal examination, no evident injury at the time of examination. And then for spending laboratory, pending po yung analysis, spermatocyte determination, gram state, and KOH. Okay. Okay. Get so, um, even no, in this uh, findings, with it's I think it's still pertinent. Although, yung yeah, again, <laughs> your role is. um not uh, uh, as the evalu uh, forensic evaluator but therapeutic but still no you can see that there is still physical trauma the, yes, diba? considering that it, it, this has been ongoing for years so yes, no. it also tells us as to how um, violent the act is considering that there's still despite the the years of um of penetration there's still mm -hmm. abrasions Yes, there yeah. are healing, partially healing, and um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, recent abrasion still. Okay. And uh, you have the results of the spermatocyte, gram stain, KOH? Well, uh, wala pa po, Dok. Um, kasi uh, the, the family, parang... Um, have... ah. <laughs> yes, po, Dok. Ano po, Dok? Uh, uh, ma mahirapan kasi silang mag-transport, Dok. Oh, okay. um, financial sa family po, Dok. Kaya, okay. ma, ano, but uh, are you able to communicate? Because th this is done in SVMC, naman, de ba? Ah, done in SVMC, po, doc. Um, maybe we can ask 
um, if if pwede as the therapist that you can have access to some of those files? I'll try po, Doc. I'll try, okay. po, doc. I'll try to ask po, Doc. Okay. Thank you po, Doc. No, so, we, must, we must the last sexual abuse and with this uh, ano, uh, obigay ni ano, examination. From, from this report po, Doc, mga around two days daw, Doc. Ah, two days. Yes, po, Doc. Because it's also important the duration, how long was the last sexual abuse and if you can catch by the sperm, no? Or for the for the work up. Kasi kung super tagal na, so you cannot anymore have the spermatocyte uh, determinations. However, if it's my, my duration of number of days, yata yan na still, we could catch up the, ano, the sperm. Around seven, yes, po, Doc. Around seven days, po, Doc. That the, okay. the sperm can still be in the um, uterus, po, Doc. Vagina or uterus, yes, po, Doc. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, I will resume my... Ano, So for the neurologic examination, um, um, again, um, it is um, unremarkable po, Doc. Um, normal po yung findings kay um, Ali. So for the general description, uh, for the mental status examination, so for the uh, general description, um, for the physical appearance, Ali was camped wearing a white jacket and blue pants. She had an ectomorphic body type. She had clean and well-trained nails and no foul body odor detected. Her behavior, Ali barely talks. She just nods most of the time, eyes, down, eyes downcast, and poor eye contact. She stayed in her seat during the interview and occasionally glances at the surroundings. For the parent-child interaction, Ali was comfortable with her aunt. She talked openly to her and there was no evidence of animosity between them. For the separation and reunion, Ali looked shy and initially uncomfortable when she was left alone with the interviewer, as evidenced by her slouch, slouch posture and soft voice. Along the course of the interview, her posture relaxed and her voice increased in volume. When her aunt joined her in the room, she became more comfortable. For the speech and language, initially, Ali's voice was slow and had a low volume that she was almost whispering. Also, she was deliberate in her answers. As the interview progressed, she became more relaxed and her voice increased in volume to moderate and clearly, clearly audible to the interviewer. For the neurovegetative function for the sleep, um, Ali reported good sleep since her family knew about her stepfather, what her stepmother did, and because she uh, and because she now know he can uh, she can uh, he can no longer abuse her. Um, for the appetite, she still had poor appetite. Uh, for the weight, she did not notice weight changes in her. For the diurnal variation, there was no change in her activities. She was mostly inactive most days, and she has um, decreased libido. For the mood and affect, um, Ali feels sad with appropriate affect. Um, for the perception, she does not have hallucination or illusions. For the thought process, she has, she has a linear thought process. For the content, she still has um, passive suicidal addition. She thought of wanting to die by hanging herself, but she does not have plans in doing it because she does not want to leave her brother. Memories of the abuse would intrude in her mind also, and she was also worried that her stepfather might take revenge on her family. For the social relatedness, Ali appeared with Ron and had poor eye contact. She has little interest in spending time with friends and classmates and has also no interest in making new friends. She, verba she verbalized a feeling fatigued with this activity. So when I asked her what her exact feeling was, she said, La man. And then for the motor behavior, Ali was able to pay attention in the duration of the interview. 
She stayed seated and did not fidget. There were also no involuntary movements, tremors, and motor hyperactivity observed. For the sensorium and cognition, Ali was oriented to three spheres. She was able to tell the time and identify the place and name of her companion. Ali had unimpaired memory. So for the concentration and attention, she was able to answer the questions correctly and she had good attention. For the serial subtraction, she was able to subtract um, seven from 100 and serially subtract seven after every answer. She was able to answer correctly. And then for the spelling, she was able to spell Pasco and in reverse also. And then for the fund of information, she was able to answer who was our national hero and what's our national bird. And for the abstract thinking, when asked about what she understood with time is gold, she, she answered that importante ang oras. So for the judgment, Ali had an impaired test and social judgment. She answered that she will return the envelope found in the street. She was also attentive and stayed on her seat during the interview. For the insight, Ali had partial insight to her illness. She was able to verbalize that she was in ITB, ITBM because she was raped and her family will file a complaint against her stepfather. For the same teachers, May, um, uh, yeah, sorry, yes, for now. Yeah. Uh, yes, for I now. would just like to know what is her, during the time that you saw her, what was her self concept or how does she see herself? With, uh, in relation uh, to with, uh, what happened to her? Uh, parang yung feeling ko niya po, Doc, is parang dirty siya, Doc. Parang worthless, tas dirty siya. And then she feels shame po, Doc, of what happened. Okay. Thank you. Because that's very important data that will help okay. you uh, plan for your non-pharmacologic treatment. Yes, ma'am. Thank you po, Doc. So for uh, this is the salient feature. So for the identifying data and history, so female, a 12 years old adolescent, grade five student with no known comorbidities with history of parental separation at three years old, left by mother at eight years to work as an OFW. She endured as uh, multiple sexual abuse starting at nine years old. She has depressed mood for approximately three years. Uh, she feels fatigue and has low energy, low motivation, disturbed sleep. She has loss of interest in pleasurable activities, has psychomotor retardation, has suicidal ideation and one suicide attempt, uh, but was unwitnessed and has intrusive thoughts regarding the abuse. And, and then, and this is also the uh, PE and mental examination findings. So uh, this is just the uh, uh, summary of what I, I mentioned earlier. So for the differential diagnosis, so first is um, major depressive disorder. So for um, so Ali was able to satisfy um, the first uh, for, for criterion A of, of major depressive disorder. So she has depressed mood. Uh, she has lost she lost interest in pleasure activities activities like playing uh, with friends and classmates. And then she has psychomotor retardation. She has weight loss. Uh, she has fatigue and loss of energy and recurrent suicidal ideation. Uh, for the criterion B, so she was, over to, she was also able to fulfill it. So um, there is um, significant impairment. So Ali no longer play with friends and classmates, does not, does not do household chores, and her grades decline. So um, for criterion C, she has no known comorbids and does not take uh, illicit substances. And for criterion D, um, uh, no psy uh, psychosis observed. And for the criterion E, she has never been... Uh, does not have manic episode or hypomanic episode. So uh, major depressive disorders will in. Um, for the persistent depressive disorder, so for the criterion, for the criterion A, so she was able to satisfy it also. She has um, depressed mood most of the day for more days than not for at least one year. Uh, for her, it's three years. So for she was also to uh, she's also able to satisfy criterion B for appetite, low energy, low self-esteem, feeling of hopelessness. For the criterion C, she has never been without depressed mood, low energy, low self-esteem, and hopelessness for more than one year. And for the criterion D, um, her symptoms also satisfy major depressive disorder for more than two years. And um, no symptoms of mania and hypomania and psychotymia were observed. 
and no symptoms of psychosis were also observed and she has no known comorbidities and does not take um, illicit substances. And um, I, and then for the, uh, sorry, po, po po yung criterion H. for the criterion H, um, um, there is a significant uh, cause, uh, it caused significant uh, distress in her, ano po, dog, so yung grades niya and then she uh, no longer do chores and um, um, does not play na po with other children. So um, uh, persistent dis depressive disorders also um, broke in. So for the the next um, the next differential diagnosis is um, oppositional defiant disorder. So uh, for the criterion A, um, she has a pattern of angry and irritable mood. Um, she's also um, argumentative uh, with uh, with authority um, authority figures, and also um, she defies um, what's uh, requested of her. However, um, with the criterion A, she was only uh, able to fulfill two out of four. So that's uh, the basis for the ruling it out. And then for the criterion B, she was able to comply it, uh, fulfill it. So her behavior caused this, uh, distress in her grandparents. Um, however, another uh, basis for ruling it out is because the behavior occurs during the course of uh, depressive disorder. So oppositional defiant disorder was ruled out. And the next um, differential diagnosis is um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, for the criterion A, um, she's a uh, she experienced multiple sexual abuse from her stepfather in a span of three years. And then for the criterion B, the inclusion symptoms. So um, initially, uh, she dreamed of the abuse and had frequent episodes of intrusive thoughts about it. However, um, at present, po, no, um, um, ano lang po, um, it became less frequent, but the intrusive uh, the dreams became less frequent, but the um, intrusive thoughts remain. So for the avoidance, um, initially tried to avoid her father, her stepfather, but um, eventually parang she became apathetic. But at present, tries to forget about the abuse by distracting herself through social media. For the criterion B, for the negative symptoms, there's a persistent negative belief about herself that she's dirty and worthless. Also, she has uh, feelings of shame from what happened to her. Uh, she also another is she feels anger, fear, and anger towards her stepfather. And there's smart diminished interest or participation activities like playing and doing chores. And then for criterion E, um, for the arousal and reactivity symptoms, um, she's irritable. She would talk back to her elders in an aggressive way. And then um, initially, she had difficulty sleeping, especially when her stepfather wa was in their home. And then for the criterion F, the duration of symptoms is three years. And then it caused clinically significant impairment in her life. She no longer play with friends and classmates, does not do household chores, and her grades decline. And she has no known uh, comorbidities and does not use illicit drugs. So uh, post-traumatic stress disorder was also ruled in. So for the working diagnosis, uh, major depressive disorder, uh, ICD uh, major depressive disorder recurrent, and then second, persistent depressive disorder with persistent depressive episode or uh, ICD is dyskinesia F34, and post-traumatic stress disorder, the ICD-10, post-traumatic stress disorder unspecified. So for the biopsychosocial, um, i sorry, do you have any questions for the, before I proceed? Can, can we go back to your diagnosis, please? Okay. So is it possible to to have two depressive disorders as your working diagnosis or one should be able to rule out the other? Um in the case for doc of uh, in this case for doc, it, it's possible for doc to have um uh parang dalawang depressive na disorder na um diagnosis doc, parang uh, double depression for doc. Um, and then, so, oh yes, saan siya na ka, ano? Kasi yung current depression is almost similar to your persistent depressive disorder. Did you notice? So, you cannot, you cannot rule out the other. Um, however, po doc, uh, in my readings, po doc, sa DSM five, it's stated, po doc, that um, um, in 
individuals whose uh, parang symptoms meet major depressive disorder criteria for two years should be given a diagnosis of PDD as well as MDD po do. So kaya the the parang double depression kaya silang dalawa po yung ginawa uh, ko na diagnosis po do. So um, what you're saying is the patient for a period of time will not experience MDD and then it will recur again over so on and off ang kanya MDD is that correct but for uh, even um, if cool. kasi recurrent man yung sabi mo so even if on and off yung depressive symptoms niya there is persistent depressive disorder with persistent depressive episode yeah, yeah yes po doc yeah yes po doc so the persistent so, uh, can you yeah can you can you state us uh, ano yung ano, ano yung mga episodes were in the patient was no longer having MDD, parang nakarecover na siya kasi the current man, recover na siya, tapos magbalik. So, ano yung mga symptoms niya during that time na the patient hindi, uh, wala mo ng MDD, pero meron siyang PDD? Um, ano po, Dok? Um, uh, if though ma hindi po niya ma kasi uh, for the MDD supposedly um ma ma tawag ito, ma satisfy yung five na na symptoms sa kanya tapos um there are times ko na hindi niya ma satisfy yun but um there is parang persistent pa rin po yung parang depressed mood niya dok Um, I suggest you go back and really uh, probably go back to your patient and try to discern or determine which of the two. And uh, kung recurrent ba? Um, her part from she, she is like a, a regular child or hindi. So remember, there are severities in each disorder baka wala siyang mga severe symptoms of depression pero meron pa rin siyang meron depression. Rin. Oo. So, uh, kindly recheck your diagnosis. Yes, doc. Yes, doc. Really noted po, doc. Hello. Thank you so much, uh, doc. Okay. Hello, good morning. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Padilla and even myself, even when when doctor ano, uh, presented it to me, I would opted to have one depressive disorder, no? Kasi yung pagkaintindi ko ng dystonia, it's actually a long-standing, fluctuating, and a low-grade depression, di ba? It's more of the traits, although it may also overlap, no, with the MDD, but uh, or it may proceed to major depression, no, from the from the dystonia. But it's more of the dystonia kasi it's more of the habitual self, no? Tapos na accentuate yung mga traits mo or your depressive temperament. And this will also lead to MDD. So this, ano, i-clarify ko lang. Di ba nag-start ito after the the depressive after signs the, and symptoms? Started after the sexual abuse? Yes, but or, after or it, So ibig sabihin, even before the sexual abuse before the trauma or before this ano uh, sexual abuse the patient is not uh, manifesting any of the kahit na any de depressive signs and symptoms so wala siyang mga habitual self of or any or traits of a depressive features no so it's what happened after kaya nga sabi ko baka more of the MDD uh, mm -hmm. kasi pasok din siya with the uh, MDD kasi pag MDD it's more of it's more of parang subjective no lesser yata 
ang ano yung objective symptoms so uh, i think it's more of i won't ko lang it's more of the mdd para masok man siya lahat kasi pag magdistymia ka it happen even before the incident although i think you're discussing more of the duration kasi nagsabi sa duration ng criteria if we will do it ba it's uh, two years or more although this happened lang when he was she was still ano no the incident happened when she was still nine years it's old already tapos, abuse yeah the abuse and now she's already 12 years old no so i think hindi ko masyado magets ang um, there's already a presence of this time yeah. it's more of the mdd will will cover everything so it check na lang yun lang ang idea ko thank you thank you so much doc i will i will review for doc my diagnosis for doc so for the biopsychosocial profile so for the predisposing um factors so a um, maternal stress and uh, female at 12 years old so for the psychological the coping mechanisms um for coping mechanism of withdrawal and isolation for the relationship, uh, losing father in a young age, and environment for social economic status. So for the precipitating, um, stress in these changes, in the norepinephrine serotonin and dopamine concentration in the limbic system, and then the precipitating is the, in the psychological, the trauma from the sexual abuse, and then the social is the lack of support from her step family, and then for the environment, still poor social economic status. And then for the perpetuating, the persistent neurotransmitter imbalance, and then for the psychological threats from the stepfather, the, the shame she felt, and then learned helplessness in her part and stress from ongoing case. And then for the social um, is the lack of communication among family members for relationship with her mother and the presence of the stepfather in the community. While for the environment, um, the still poor socioeconomic status and the upcoming trial. Whereas for the protecting, the, she has a development, uh, a development, her development is at par with age and she's compliant to her medications. And for the psychological, she has some degree of resilience. So she has the capacity to seek help ngayon po, and then able to maintain grades despite her illness. And then she has good premorbid functioning. So she's able to establish friendships, responsible and well-mannered child. And he had good grades that suggest a normal IQ. And then for, for the social, um, since um, the events were known, so she, had, she, has, she has good family support, no? And then for the environment, so the ITBM support and the community rallying support for Ali. So for my psychodynamic formulation, so this is a case of a 12-year-old female student who experienced an alleged multiple sexual abuse by her stepfather for a duration of three years. She reported um, intrusive thoughts, um, avoidance of the memories of the abuse by distracting herself through social media, and has persistent depressed mood, irritability, lack of energy and motivation, and negative self-image and suicidality. So for the biological aspect, so being pregnant at a young age and having a husband who was idle, Alice's mother was stressed during her pregnancy with her. So the fetal origins hypothesis states that the maternal psychological state can alter the physiology in utero and it can have sustained effect across the life span. So clinical studies link pregnant women's exposure to a range of traumatic as well as chronic and common life stressors to significant alterations in children's neurodevelopment, including increased risk for autism, affective disorders, and reduced cognitive ability. More recently, maternal antenatal anxiety and or depression have been shown to predict increased risk for neurodevelopmental disorders in children and to confer risk for future mental illness. Reports show that elevated levels of antenatal depression and anxiety are associated with poor emotional adjustment in young children, and it has been found to extend into adolescence. So brain development is a delicately choreographed sequence of overlapping events in which timing is crucial, and any deviation from this pattern has the potential to lead to inappropriately timed neuronal birth migration and or synaptogenesis, and ultimately to miswiring and significant compromises in the function of the brain. Stress during pregnancy leads to physiological dysregulation, leading to activation of maternal hypo hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or the HPA axis, causing a cascade of hormonal responses. The resultant in increased, re increased levels of glucocorticoids, the maternal cortisol, into the bloodstream can cross the placental barrier 
and affects the fetal brain development. Exposure, exposure to maternal corticoids overwhelms the fetus's um, regulatory mechanism, causing epigenetic change to the fetal HPA axis functioning, leading to the development of various psychopathologies such as impaired affect and behavioral dysregulation. In addition, the neurostructural and biologic alterations may cause heightened inflammatory response and elevate the dopamine release, which may in turn cause neurocognitive impairment. These cognitive deficits may further compound the risk due to its impact on the ability of an individual to adapt to stressors. So for the psychosocial aspect, uh, learning theory plays a central role in the development in human behavior, including voluntary and involuntary motor behaviors, thinking, and emotion. Learning is a change in behavior resulting from repeated practice, and both the environment and the behavior interact to produce the learned change. Learned helplessness develop, develops when an individual learns that no behavior pattern can influence the environment. So Ali is a victim of an alleged sexual abuse and per perpetrated by her stepfather. He threatened her, hence she did not report the incident to anyone. When the abuse was repeated, she took courage and reported it despite the threat to her life. However, the person she reported to did not believe her and instead reprimanded her for making up stories. When she was transferred to the care of her biological grandmother, it was supposed to be the solution to her problem. Yet still, her stepfather was able to abuse her. She tried to protect herself from further abuse by locking her door, but that too didn't work. In. But that too didn't work. Um, to escape from the abuse, she tried killing herself, but that again didn't happen because her aunt arrived in their house. All her attempts apparently do not work. This made Ali realize that there's no way out of her situation. Uh, no, matter, no matter what she tried to do, the outcome would still be the same. Her stepfather can still sexually abuse her. So according to the learned helplessness theory, the experience with uncontrollable events, that is the sexual abuse, can lead to the expectation that no responses will control the future outcomes. This expectation of no control leads to first motivational deficits wherein over time, an individual has lowered response initiation and lowered persistence. Second, cognitive deficits wherein there is inability to perceive existing opportunities to control outcomes. Like in the case of Ali, um, she, can, she can report it to her biological grandparents. And third, emotional deficits that include sadness and lowered self-esteem. So Ali stopped attempting to protect herself. She failed to realize that she can report the incident to her biological family. Who may, who may have believed her, and she developed depression. So um, for the goals of treatment, so my short uh, Excuse answer, me. I, yes, but Sorry. Can, can you go back to the biologic aspect, please? Okay, well, it is true that you mentioned about what happened to the mother during pregnancy, but uh, do you have any explanation biologically on what happens to the brain if there is chronic abuse? What changes in neurotransmitter systems will be there if the person is exposed to chronic abuse, like in your patient? Um, HPA rin ba? Um, parang ano po, Dok? Um, um, serotonin na dysregulation po, Dok. So, um, mag, mag decrease po yung, ano, mag decrease po yung, um, uh, from, from what I uh, remember lang po, Dok, um, there's uh, parang dysregulation sa serotonin po, Dok. And then there's also parang changes po in, um, in a in a, a chromos, I forgot the uh, okay. Just to because uh, <laughs> oh, oh, uh, for biologic aspect, you, you look at the the matter, meaning yung the brain in it, itself, the physical aspect of the brain. Naglaki ba ang mga ko ano jan? Oh, or and then next you look at the neuro biologic aspect, yung mga neurotransmitters, 
yung, yung mga connections niya, hormonal aspect, yung mga ano. So, messaging between each areas of the brain. So, that's biologic aspect. Um, I think it, you should also, you really should look into the brain changes when a person is exposed to chronic trauma kasi meron man yan siya. So, and then for your psychological aspect, can you, can you please go to the next slide? For your psychological aspect, um, hindi ako sure kung ano yung ginamit mo, but uh, I'm sure that you, you were also using learning theory. Yes, yes, for that learning theory, for that. Uh -uh. So the patient learned to yung just, just receive whatever abusive treatment she had. And uh, hindi niya nakita na may escape, okay? Although except yung mag-suicide or whatever. But uh, overall, what, uh, how can you explain the depressive episode of your patient? and the PTSD. Kasi yan yung diagnosis mo. When it the, comes to psychological aspect. Oo. For the emotion uh, for the depression po no. Um uh, it, it, uh, it can be explained by the emotional deficits that um that result from the sa learned helplessness din po do. Na parang uh, Part of the emotional deficit would be yung kanang sadness and the lowered self-esteem, and then um, eventually um, uh, resulting to uh, depression. For the PTSD, po, doc, um, it can also be explained by um, learning theory, also doc, sa parang uh, class classical conditioning, po, doc, wherein um, na parang na na pair niya yung um, reminders around her to the abuse na ginagawa sa kanyang stepfather so even if um wala yung stepfather she can um other things can, can still remind her of it po doc so yun mga merong mga thoughts that would remind um uh, that's why mga mga intrusive thoughts that uh would come and uh, would enter her mind and then um and then also that I know that she would um avoid those um thoughts para lang thoughts and feelings para lang hindi ma remind of those uh, of the abuse. So, uh ang suggestion ko is to read more about that, more uh, more about the psychological aspect of ano of what happened to your patient. Huh? Yes, pa, doc. Yeah, yes, ano pa, mo doc. na lang, read na lang on your own. Sige, thank you. Yes, pa, doc. Thank you so much, doc. So for the goals of treatment, so my, my short-term goals um, include uh, control of symptoms, prevention of um, harm to self and uh, uh, to self, to process the trauma experienced by the patient, and to provide education about her illness to the patient and the family. And then for the um, for the uh, long-term goals, uh, prevention of relapse of the depressive episodes. Uh, to process the trauma experienced by the members of the family and uh, to provide um, anticipatory guidance and prepare the patient and family for triad. So for the patient's course, so the initial encounter, so the uh, subjective findings, gilab tanto sa kung ama-ama, um, uh, objective findings, um, um, unremarkable, and then the MSC. Um, as mentioned po earlier, and then uh, during this time po, doc, um, ito po yung uh, uh, diagnosis po, po um, major depressive disorder uh, to consider persistent depressive disorder with depressive with persistent depressive episode and to consider post traumatic disorder. Kasi on the initial encounter po, doc, um, hindi pa po um, ganun pa complete po yung nakuha ko na um, information from from the patient and the family. So kaya to consider pa yung dalawa. And then for that time, plans of management, um, laboratory tests were ordered. So CBC, yeah, urinalysis, um, SGPT, SGOT, serum, sodium, potassium, um, 
the thyroid um, uh, FT4 and test age, um, serum creatinine, 12 lead CCG, chest X-ray, and pregnancy test. And then the a medication started on the scalogram, 10 milligrams, um, one half tablet for four days, then increased to one tablet thereafter. Also, safety planning was done because um, she has uh, suicidal aviation. Um, as for your psychotherapy rendered, psychoeducation done, and to follow up after two weeks. So for uh, the use of uh, the use of escitalopram, so according to to the guidelines for adults with depression in um, primary care, so they did um, um, randomized controlled trials of antidepressants based on um, clinical global impression. So um, here highlighted here is that um, it's shown that escitalopram in two studies um, it has 63 and 64 percent respectively that it has um, response rates to uh, depression in children. And then also FDA um, approved um, escitalopram for use in depression for age 12 years old and older. So um, that's, if that's the choice of uh, my choice of management uh, drug for, for this patient. And then um, for the first follow-up two weeks after, so um, the Dr. patient, Ness, uh, yes, in the, the interest of time, can you summarize for us uh, your man, uh, your course of outpatient treatment? Thank you. Uh, yes, for that. So um, I only had um, two follow-ups with the patient. First is face-to-face. -face. The second was supposed to be face-to-face, -face, but um, nag yun po nung nag quarantine, so <laughs> naging teleconsultation po siya. So yung first follow-up po. Uh, po um, naglabas po yung results ng kanyang um, laboratory test. It turned out normal po, do. Pregnancy test was negative. And then um, the medication is continued. At this, this time around, one tablet na po siya ng esetalopram. And then again, safety planning still done kasi meron pa din po siyang suicidal ideation. And then that, uh, around this time, since naka esetalopram na siya, more receptive na yung patient, and then more comfortable na yung patient sa akin, that's when I did the um yung pinasas ko yung trauma, yung traumatic experience niya. And then we also did um um uh what do you call this one? Uh supervision with uh with with Dr. Bidignos also. And then um plan to start um trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy. So um so this is the ano po, the parang support of the choice of psychotherapy. So it is um in this, uh, so recommendation na uh, trauma-focused psychotherapy should be considered first-line treatment for children and adolescents with PTSD. So um, these are the things that uh, this is about trauma-focused therapy. It is a structured component-based time-limited intervention, includes education about trauma, provides strategies to promote relaxation and positive coping skills, also uh, teach techniques to address inaccurate or helpful thoughts related to the abuse, like what she's feeling about being worthless, yung parang dirty, and then gradual exposure to enable the child to share details of her experience uh, and process her, her trauma-related thoughts and feelings. And also, uh, we have joint parent-child session to increase, uh, sorry, to increase um, open communication about the abuse and its impact. Tapos yung uh, second na follow-up was done through teleconsultation because of the quarantine. So through, I talked to the grandmother and the patient. So yun po dok, same pa rin po dok, continue lang po yung escitalopram at the time and then safety planning. And then uh, to start pa rin po yung trauma focus and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Tapos yung next follow-up niya po is this um, coming September 16, 2021. Yun po. And then, so these are her diagnostics na uh, yun po. Um, it's um, a parang, uh, unremarkable po siya. So my prognosis for the patient, um, uh, children and adolescents with histories of sexual abuse have been found to exhibit um, higher rates of depression and suicidality. So this highlights the importance of early recognition and treatment of PTSD as they may significantly improve long-term outcome among youth. So the patient has a long term uh, the patient has a long-standing PTSD that was not addressed in addition to to continued exposure to trauma for three years. Indeed, the patient developed depression and has persist persistent suicidality. With the initiation of treatment and therapy for PTSD, the patient can have a um, chance in achieving a better prognosis from PTSD and her comorbid depression. So with regards to the patient's depressive disorder, so um, at this time, PDD kasi yung ko talaga, So has a protracted recovery 
And I mean, episode length is about four years. So the presence of a comorbid externalizing disorder appears to add almost 2.5 years to this episode length, which suggests that the comor comorbidity should be addressed first. So externalizing uh, symptoms of the patient include irritability and defiance to authority. But unfortunately, it hasn't been a uh, full-blown disorder in the case of Ali, so wala siyang ODD. So the treatment of the patient's PTSD uh, may have a positive effect on the prognosis of her uh, PDD or her depression. So so um, so basically, po doc, yung uh, you know, uh, yung prognosis ko po sa kanya is um, as long as yung support ng family is um, there uh, is uh, parang um, continued po yung support consistent po sila. So um, then considering also she has a good pre-morbid um, functioning and then also if parang if maka-achieve po siya ng justice from what happened to her so these factors can help her improve her self image and and achieve remission from her illness so ito po yung final diagnosis ko po doc and uh, and as um, as um from your inputs po doc yet i have to review po doc and go back to the patient so major depressive disorder, um, persistent depressive disorder with persistent depressive episode, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's the end for the, of, of my case, and then I will now proceed for, for my discussion. So um, for the dis uh, my discussion is about um, a step by step na preparation for in preparing the child for court. So basically, um, uh, what I included here is um, what I will say to the patient or what what I will. Uh, Yes, With regards to the discussion, um, you focused more on the child, no? Yes, po, Dok. Child, okay, po, Dok. Anong sasabihin ko sa kanya? <laughs> okay, okay. But also, were you able to address the concerns of the family? Sa, sa family po, Dok, um, yung parang immediate na concern ko sa, kan sa kanila at that time, Dok, is uh, yung blaming nila, Dok, for sa each other. Na, mm -hmm. uh -oh, so, um, uh, I plan po doc, to process it with them. Pero hindi ko pa po siya na nagawa po doc. Mm -hmm. Were you able to have that supervised? Kasi yun nga no in in child and adolescent cases, the family is a very very big factor, no? Yes, and um yes, it's good that you are focusing on the child with regards to your therapy, but you also have to keep in mind that um her environment is mostly her family, ba? Yes, um, Especially um, ngayon na hindi siya pinapalabas and everything, di ba? Yes, Udo. Yes, Udo. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. oh. So, um, we, uh, in, from, from, we are going to talk, discuss it with Dr. Abelignos, Doc. So, uh, ano po, Doc? Um, uh, yung time, at the time of our supervision, uh, yung patient pa lang po yung napag-usapan namin. Pero yes, po, Doc, included po yung family eventually po, Doc, sa, sa therapy po, Doc. And um, I am having so, yeah, uh, supervision I mean, with her. Okay, okay. Kasi yun nga, I, I do understand you you don't you want to focus on on you know your individual therapy first. But yes, however, uh you can already start to kumbaga um uh psychoeducate the family on how they can mm -hmm. help also uh with regards mm -hmm. to improving improving the dynamics that they have currently. Kasi di ba um one of the things that they noticed before they knew of the incident was that they started noticing Nana. She was irritable. She was defiant, which yes, isn't so like her. So it mm -hmm. would have been good to educate them that these are also part of um, the symptoms. Tama ba? The mm -hmm. signs and I, I, with regards to that, po, doc, I was able to um, explain it to them, okay. naman, po, doc, okay. those symptoms. Um, I, was, I, I especially... Um, um, made emphasis on the suicidality po, do, kasi um, is, yun yung po yung, uh, yung nagkausap kami ng grandmother, yun po yung concern niya do, kasi parang in her part um, hindi siya comfortable to ask okay. the patient about it kasi parang natakot siya na if she will ask daw, baka daw ma-remind yung bata at mag-suicide parang yun okay. yung Which fear is, niya ano, do uh -oh. that's, yes, also, that's very a very common concern oh. And that's a common uh, that's a common um, misconception for laymen, ba? So as as psychiatrists, it it can be our role to to clarify that na um, it's it's okay to talk about it, ba? 
Yes, po, Doc. I was able to tell her that, po, Doc. Yes, okay. po, Doc. Okay. Uh-huh. Sige, sige. Kasi parang so, nangyari, Doc, she asked me, ano yung sagot? <laughs> I, tell, I told her na, um, I know the answer, pero I promise Ali na what we talk is parang um, kanang confidential. confidential. So, I told her na, it's actually parang safe po, ma'am, na you can ask her. Parang ganun okay. po. And then, But, parang uh, I oh. encourage her po, Doc. Okay. With regards to confidentiality rin with the adolescent and the child, ha? Be careful also to Um, uh, balance confidentiality with safety. safety. Yes, okay. okay. So, so, so this um uh, discussion for the um um so yung step by step is first I will tell the child what is sexual assault. So defend the definition of it. So it's when a person forces or forces you into sexual act. Then also inform the child who can do it to her. So it could be a stranger, a date, a relative, an acquaintance, or basically anybody. And then, so what what includes sexual assault? So these are so fondling, oral sex, anal sex, or intercourse or penetration by objects. It can be something you are forced or coerced to do. And then also tell her that when you are under 13, any sexual act by an older teen or adult is sexual assault. It can happen to all races and ages, rich and poor, both males and females. And then family sexual abuse is called incest. So it can be from her parents, the parents, siblings, or other relatives or caretakers. And then incest often occurs over long periods of time and may begin with confusing touch and move on to penetration. So with incest, then, you, there is... Ano? Ay, Sorry. I summarize um, na po, Doc. Yes, po, Doc. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so... Apart from and after that, Doc, I will also tell uh, tell her that the spelling miss. So it is that uh, parang telling her that sexual assault is still even if dated or under under the influence of alcohol or even if um uh it's still sexual it's still an assault if if you are blamed for how she dressed or if she didn't fight back. In the case of the patient, she didn't fight back, so it's still sexual assault. And then. Also, um, educate her and how others may react. So, um, like in her family, so they blame themselves for the assault. So the family has been blaming one another. And then also, I will also tell her that. And then um, they would become overprotective because of their fears, which is happening to, to her. And then, and then um, others may might pressure her to stop char- to drop the charges. But importantly, others a lot of them would listen, support her, and be with her when she needs them. And then also educate her about uh, the possible concerns. Uh, uh, I will uh, tell lawyers um, or so and then they or the me if the person. Suspect there, also that um the this the suspect and then there's only one moment waiting for her to become online. I also teach her about the law, so what it means to be, uh, what it, it means to be, parang mag-prosecute to me and bring the person you believe assaulted you in the court of law. And then I also re- remind her that consent is not an issue. So the, the court will listen to what was done to, to force or coerce her. And then her resistance does not need to be proven. And that her testimony is all that is needed as proof. But if they have evidence, it will make the case stronger. Also, the, also inform her of the hard facts that the law, um, so yung accused is presumed innocent until proven guilty in court. So yun. And then also uh, inform her of the, uh, st- uh, the events that will happen so that there's preliminary investigation, there's arraignment and plea, pre-trial, trial, and judgment. And then from her side, uh, we'll remind her that um, 
uh, to tell the prosecutor all the facts about what happened to her. And then um, there are times that her answer, she might think that her answer will make her look, ba look bad, but remember that it's not her decision to be attacked. She did not ask to be abused and she is not to blame. On the other side, Doc also informed her that um, the other side would try to also to intimidate her, try to, I don't know, they would ask questions that seem unfair or confuse her, um, try to make her feel angry, so try to imply that she consented, so also inform her that uh, these are part also of the court because the, the other side is trying to defend themselves also. And then for, and remember also that during the trial, she will be asked to remember the, what happened to her, the events leading to the assault, the assault, the assault hit, Uh, so we also prepare for that. And then for the sentencing, so once trial has ended and the legal proceedings are over, she may, she may feel a big letdown afterwards. She may experience a wide, wide range of emotions from satisfaction to sadness. So um, that's the end product of my... Um, uh, justice, uh, the Teen Bill of Rights. So I have the right to be listened to, have someone point out my strengths, be supported, have private time and space, do things for fun, listen to other ideas and may not have thought of, and to accept or reject them, to be treated respectfully, to live a violence-free life, to be good to myself. So I have a right to be happy. And that's the end product of my case presentation. These are my reference, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Des. Um, just one clarification, no? Um, it's good that you were able to take note of the clinical, uh, um, what do you call this, diagnosis. But I noticed you did not include also in your final diagnosis the abuse itself. Uh, but we have codes for... also. Yes, uh, yes, <laughs> so I, I, I understand that you are not, again, no, you are not the evaluator. <laughs> But still, that should still be included um, in your diagnosis as the therapist. Yes, thank you. Okay. okay. Any other comments or clarifications from the consultant? I guess. Uh -huh. I guess. Ako kasi ang ano niyo. I am actually this uh, supervising her case, so I would like to congratulate this because she made everything. Actually, nag-supervise na ako, but yes, everything is already complete, no? Yes, she had a very no, comprehensive, no. comprehensive, ano, um, presentation. Pero yung akin lang, I was still into the, this would be your, ano na, parang forensic case desk. Yun na to deck, nakadeck na sa'yo. No, no, no. Under Dr. Perucho. Therapeutic pala siya, sorry. Therapeutic pala siya. Oh, nga, tama pala. Pero I would still, I'm still convinced that everything falls into MDD. Kasi meron siyang suicidal. Din. You cannot find suicidal suicidality in, ano, in mm -hmm. this time. Yeah. And it's that this time it's always life is empty. Life is, has no joy. It's an habitual. Ano, parang gano. But it happened kasi after the sexual abuse. So anyway, thank you so much and congratulations. Yes. Thank you for the. Uh, may I also yes, add? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, in addition to uh, actually, the part of what I'm going to say, nasabi na ni Doctor Bing Mabunga. But uh, in addition to that, because I I came late. Did you since you are handling clinical aspect of the of this patient? Did you present the CPG? Uh, I was able to present the, the CPG for that. CPG for PTSD, for MDD. In no, uh, oh, no, but I wasn't able to present the CPG for that. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. And also, this, no, of course, in it's good to be as detailed as possible in forensic, uh, even if you are the, the, the therapist. Uh, with regards to cases, no. So, um, just a comment with your protocol. Reminder, lang, ha. Huh? You include. Yes, um, you don't just mention that there was abuse. You specify um, anong classing abuse, ha. Huh? 
Um, Actually, although no, uh, nga, lengthy uh, yes, naman no, na no. yung ano mo, oh. lengthy naman na yung yung protocol that you submitted. But still, I was looking for that na was there petting, was there um, penetration, ejaculation, all of those things. Ah, yes, po, Doc. Yes, po, Doc. Sige, Des. Uh, Thank pero you so much, Doc. That, uh, it's a good sorry. Question. Yes, Doc? Oh, yeah. Oo, oh, maganda ang case. I agree. Pero, uh, anong kami yung, I forgot the term that the the patient confided the abuse to her. Ano ganiin siya? Andiyan ba si Betty? Na, to, na to, nasabi niya? To kanino, Doc? Term, kay sa doctor niya, the, the child was able to inform the doctor. Meron niya siyang legal term that should also be included. Even if, ano siya, therapist siya nag-divulge ng sexual abuse or something that should also be included. Okay. So, the state aside from, from, from the therapy. It, oh, no. Yes. That's okay. So, take note of that desk na lang din. <laughs> yes, Pado. No. Okay. So, if there are no more questions or clarifications, can we ask everyone to turn on their cameras for attendance purposes before we go? So, uh, there are three uh, pages. So, we'll start with the first smile. Second. Nag-load nag pa po. Look. Uh, second. And then third. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Good day, everyone.